Hey everybody, welcome to this week's stream. So, this week's going to be a little different. Um, we, um, I decided to relax a little bit today, it's my birthday, um, and so I didn't want to have to do anything too, too hardcore crazy today. So, we're going to talk about a lot of stories today. And for those of you that are, you know, thinking about becoming a game designer, looking at, you know, into becoming, you know, and getting into game production, um, whether you're, you know, thinking about working at an indie studio all the way up through, you know, a, a mid-sized developer to a full-sized developer, internally at a studio, at a publisher or in the publishing world, um, and just kind of everything in between, I'm just going to kind of talk about my experiences, the, the project I've worked on, um, and just kind of tell some stories about what some of the projects were like, um, what made them challenging, what made them hard, you know, um, and just kind of blab about stuff today. And it's a little bit ad hoc. I don't really have a, a plan. Um, you know, again, today was supposed to kind of be a little bit easier for me <laughs> just getting up here to talk to you all and, and tell some stories about the industry and kind of what it's, what it's like to be in the industry. So, um, so bear with me and, you know, and hopefully this will kind of give a, a little bit of insight for, for anyone, you know, about um, um, what the game industry is like and, you know, and why, you know, it's a, it's a fun place to, to work, right? So anyhow, um, again, please join in today. You know, if you guys are, anybody's watching yet, um, feel free to jump on in and, and ask questions and, you know, and stuff. This is definitely, you know, again, a conversation for everybody to, to be part of. Um, so thanks again for joining me today. And, you know, um, probably next week or something, we'll get back to kind of the regularly scheduled um, stuff about maybe going back to the first person shooter designs. Um, but again, this week, you know, I'm taking a little bit easy. So glad that you can join me on my birthday and, and um, get a little bit of advice from an old man. So, um, so when I started in the industry, you know, I started in movie visual effects. I worked for a little while doing a, a wide variety of computer graphics and, and really kind of started as an artist. And while you don't need to be, you know, an artist to be a good game designer, you know, it de definitely helps to have a lot of, you know, background in art and art production, animation, you know, all those kinds of areas. And so that was, you know, a huge help for me. And you know, it also um, was good that I have engineering degrees. And so, you know, I also kind of came from a, a background of, of engineering. And so that was something else that, that did help out, you know, quite a bit. And so I was a bit of an anomaly when I first got in the industry, you know, being a, you know, um, an artist really with a technical background, you know, and back in the day when, you know, it was still pretty er pretty early in the industry, right? And so... I actually got my first job in the game industry as a um, as an artist, you know, and as an animator, and you know, was doing um, cutscene graphics and things like that. Having come out of the movie industry, and was doing a lot of pre-rendered cutscenes, a little bit of in-game art, um, things like that. But um, you know, at the time, using 3D Studio, um, we were in the early days. It still was using 3D Studio um, for DOS, not even 3D Studio Max. Um, you know, and so um, things were pretty primitive back then when it came to, you know, to to making stuff. And so, but it wasn't, you know, until I was at my first company, um, Ronin Entertainment, just for, you know, I was there for just a matter of days, really. And they saw a, you know, a sci-fi novel that I was writing. And, and um, I started, you know... Next thing you know, writing the story for the games, you know, and, and so I find myself, I'm doing art and I'm doing writing. And then I hadn't been there that long. And, and, um, one of the guys who became my mentor and taught me how to be a game designer was this guy named Ed Killam. And Ed was an amazing, um, amazing man. And he had been the, the designer on X-Wing and TIE Fighter. And so Ed, um, was really a programmer at heart, you know, an engineer and wanted to kind of go back into doing that. And so he um, decided to train me in being a game designer. And so, hold on one sec, I'm just putting the chat over so I can see it a little bit better. Um, so Ed 
you know, kind of taught me how to be a game designer. And, you know, I learned kind of the ropes of being a game designer from him. It was not ever a, you know, a job that I meant to have or meant to get into. It was just something I kind of, kind of fell into. And because I, I've always been a bit of a jack of all trades, you know, and having the engineering side of me, the art side of me, everything else, you know, it, it worked, it worked well to combine those together. And, you know, the, the very first game I worked on, I did, you know, um, the majority of the, the pre-rendered cutscenes on the game. You can see the game called Armor Command, uh, about right, or is it out? You can't turn in the, in the, in the grand scheme of things there, <laughs> is Armor Command. Um, and, um, and so the, um, Armor Command game, I did all the cutscenes for it, but I also wrote the story for it, and I did some game design for it, you know, and a little bit of everything, and so that was kind of my, my second game in the industry, and, you know, um, second real game, and, you know, and doing a lot of different, wearing a lot of different hats, and my roles kind of progressed, you know, through that. Um, and, yeah, to answer, so, um, Jay Gal, nice to meet you, and, and thanks for joining. Um, so to give you guys just a little bit of, of like, just a fast forward to give you guys a little bit of context, you know, so you know who I am, you know, for those of you that don't, um, you know, I've been in the industry now almost 30 years. Um, you can see some of the games on the, on the shelf here. These are all games I've worked on, um, and many more. Um, you know, I've worked on well over a hundred games, you know, in the industry, um, predominantly PC console. Um, but I've worked on about a dozen mobile games, you know, as well, um, some MMORPGs, you know, and, you know, and a wide variety of stuff and some other kind of related um, areas as well. Uh, some simulation stuff, you know, um, medical and VR, you know, things, um, AR, VR projects and stuff like that. So definitely have been involved in, in a lot of different things. But, but my career went from being um, an engineer. Um, and so my degrees are in astrophysics and mechanical engineering. Um, then, but my dad was an artist and so I actually learned kind of both growing up. And so I, I came in doing movie visual effects for five years. I came into video games, uh, and then worked in games, um, now for over 25 years, um, probably pushing 30 years just in games now. Um, and, um, so I progressed kind of from being an artist very quickly into being kind of a game designer, um, very quickly into becoming in what we call creative director. Um, and you know, I, I then worked into a studio level side of things, um, where I was, um, so I've worked at both small companies, like small independent studios, um, anywhere from five people to, you know, 50 or hundred people. Um, but then I joined companies like Microsoft and EA, Ubisoft, um, things like that, where I was a creative director across studios and across, um, the entire groups. And stuff. So in those particular roles, I was not a creative director on a single project. I was a creative director across sometimes dozens and dozens of projects at any one time. Um, and so I would be, you know, head of, you know, and overseeing, you know, um, like action, you know, like at Microsoft, like action strategy, role playing, you know, a bunch of those types of games. I did not work on, I've never worked on any sports or racing, all that stuff, but I definitely have worked across a lot of different titles. Um, so, over the years, you know, I've been in most of the major studios. Um, and then um, quickly, you know, over some time, maybe after 10 years, I, I then became a senior producer and then um, became kind of a, a executive producer and then kind of a project lead. And the executive producer, um, project lead roles are kind of interchangeable and it really varies from company to company. But I'm kind of the, the usually the project lead and usually the, the person that's running the project um, and so I did that for a long time and then that progressed to, I spent about, um, eight years as a, or actually more than that, almost 10 years, um, as a studio head. And so basically running entire studios, running entire companies, basically CEO, um, of my own companies or, um, and some of my companies had like 300 something people. So, you know, some of my companies were decently sized, um, so, and then running studios, um, you know, running major studios at Samsung, at Disney, you know, big companies. So I've had both sides of being in kind of the indie, you know, independent 
Um, and I say Indian independent because Indy is seen as like low cost, cheap stuff, you know, versus an independent studio. Um, you might be making a $25 million game. You're not an indie studio, right? You're an independent studio at that point. So making that distinction there. Um, and then I've run studios within, like I said, major publishers, um, for a long time as well. Um, I've also, you know, um, have a tremendous amount of experience overseas, um, I, I lived overseas for 10 years, I um, spent five years in China, uh, a couple years in India, Brazil, you know, all over the world, Montreal, Canada, um, various places. So I also have a reputation of being somebody who really understands the, the nature of the business overseas. Um, so recently, after I left, my last corporate gig was at Samsung, um, running a studio there and, um, and doing a lot of other, other kind of related technologies and stuff. Um, and so now I wanted to get back two years ago. I decided I really want to get back more into the heart of a product instead of running a studio and running dozens of projects and, and not really being able to touch the nitty gritty of a project. I've now transitioned back more into, um, and my current company is doing creative direction role, um, some executive producer type role, a little bit of, you know, a little bit of both. So an executive producer, maybe doing more P and L's doing business development, you know, running schedules, you know, that kind of stuff. And then the, the creative side, you know, creative direction. So I'm kind of wearing both hats of it right now. Um, and then also I'm part of CG Spectrum. And, you know, I developed, uh, for those of you who don't know, I developed the game design um, curriculum course here. Um, I'm kind of, I guess you would call me the teacher. Um, I also do some mentoring and stuff, but I'm really the department head for game design um, as well. And like I said, I'm the one that, that came up with the idea for the game design course and, and built it all. So I'm to blame, um, whether you love it or hate it, but, you know, it is what it is. But I brought, you know, my... 20, 30 years experience into that and really try to create a program that was very different. So, um, so just kind of give me a sense for, I, in all honesty, I've been in the trenches. I've been an art director. I've been a creative director. I've been a game designer. I've been a senior producer. I've been an executive producer. I've been a vice president. I've been a CEO. Um, you know, and I've, and I've done all those at big companies and I've done all those, you know, on big, big projects. Um, you know, I've won lots of awards and, and, you know, um, games like Rainbow Six Vegas and things like that, you know, um, Game of the Year. And, you know, and I've had that in my past, you know, as well, too. Uh, you know, and even on mobile and stuff, I've had decent success doing Roller Coaster Tycoon mobile games like that, that, you know, had maybe 75 million downloads um, and things. So, you know, I definitely have had a, a number of very big hits um, and stuff. So I've never, you know, I, while I've worked on indie things, you know, the, bu the bulk of my career has been really making big AAA products at big companies um, and stuff. So that kind of gives you guys a little bit of context. I won't bore you too long with my resume. That's not what today is about. But I want you guys to understand that this is coming from somebody who really has been in the trenches, you know, and, and has kind of really worn all those hats um, um, for a long time, right? And um, so you can see, you know, in the past that I, you know, worked on games, you know, like Rainbow Six Vegas and, you know, Fable and Munch's Odyssey and Mercenaries and the Ratchet and Clank series and Resistance Fall of Man and, um, you know, Halo and, you know, some small games, right? And, and so I've done everything from open world games um, to, you know, shooters to strategy games. Um, I oversaw... Um, for a while, the Age of Empires franchise, Command and Conquer franchise, um, the Star Wars Empire War franchise. Um, I've worked on several Star Wars, you know, RTSs. Um, so I've, I've probably worked on maybe a dozen um, RTS strategy games um, and things. Those are one of my fortes, you know, doing strategy games. Um, and um, so kind of all over the board, you know, I, I've, but I've not been somebody that's done sports and racing. Um, the, the, the most I've done is, Urch. This game right there, which was TNA Wrestling, um, that was the only I'd call sports-ish game that I did, but really it's a fighting game. Um, I would not quite put it into the sports game category, but I really, and I did one game that's kind of under, over my shoulder there um, called Band Fuse Rock Legends, which was a 
so, somewhat educational, somewhat you know, music-based game as well. That was kind of a one-off from my normal rep, you know, repertoire. But most of my career has been doing action, strategy, role-playing, um, those types of, you know, a lot of platforming games, you know, th those kinds of things. Um, I've done a tremendous amount of things from Psychonauts to Voodoo Events, Munch's Odyssey, the you know, Ratchet and Clank, a lot of those kinds of things. So I definitely have done a lot of the really big um, action platforming games as well. So, so that's, you know, that's kind of me, right? And, but I, and again, I say that just so you guys have some context of, hey, who is this idiot in front of you that's talking and telling me stories, right? It's important that you kind of, kind of get that. All right, Jay, um, got a few more questions here. Let me catch up. And please, again, um, for those of you that are just joining us, thanks. Um, and, and today we're doing a, a special um, edition uh, a one-off. It's my birthday, so um, I didn't really feel like preparing anything today, and so luckily I'm here with you guys all, and I didn't cancel. So um, thank you for spending my birthday with me, and I do appreciate you know you guys always for being here. Um, so today I just wanted to kind of be a little bit more casual, a little bit easier and gentler on myself. Um, these live streams are really hard to chat for two hours straight. Um, so thank you, Jay. Um, so, you know, I'm going to tell some stories today. I'm going to talk about some, you know, what it's like to work in these companies. Just kind of get you a sense for, like, what my life is and what, you know, I've done. And, and kind of hope that inspires you to become a game designer. And also, we'll talk about some production and things. So, a little bit of a mix. I really don't have a plan today. So, if you guys have, like, questions, if you want to know about a specific project, if you want to know about, like, what it's like to make indie games versus working a big publisher, you know, what it's like to be a game designer versus a level designer versus a studio head or any of that kind of stuff, like, just, just holler. I'm, I'm here to answer questions today and, and just tell stories, good and bad, and, you know, and just... You know, bear with me, the ramblings of an old man, you know, and so that's what today is all about. So, um, so yeah, glad you're, you're part of the, the program, Jay, and, you know, thanks for, um, for joining us. And, and you'll find that, you know, in a lot of my talks, um, because I've spent a lot of my time as a creative director and because I've spent, um, you know, a lot of my previous career really as an art director, you know, and art lead and, you know, animator and all these kinds of things. Um, I do approach a lot of my design work from an artistic standpoint, right? And, and stuff. And so I do think that my channel and even my course and stuff is really good for artists to understand. Um, everything that we build, we're building a world. And I say the world in the most generalized way, right? A, a world is... You know, the characters and it's the environments, the weapons I use, you know, everything about it when we're building this universe or whatever that is our game and is this universe, you know, that we may just want to make a game and might ultimately want to make a movie out of it, right? We don't we don't know. Um, and um, so when we're doing that, you know, there's form and function, right? And so, so as an artist, if you guys are here and you're, you know, you're an artist and you're not sure about game design or whatever... Um, I just want you guys to know, like, this is this is um, not irrelevant information for you, right? Because quite often, there's not a right or wrong answer about form and function and which one comes first. But you've got to think about them kind of both in the same routes, right? So if you're an artist, you got to think about, like, yeah, I'm going to make this cool-looking dude, right? And he's got he's to be strong and he's got to be powerful and he's got to have all these things. But then you're like, well, like, what's his skills and abilities? Like, does he shoot fire out of his eyes, Do, you know? Um, or what are those things that he needs that a game designer is going to need in order to, to make this thing fun, right? And and make this thing playable and have the skills. So so if you're not like constantly working in a really tight um, coordination with a game designer when you're doing art direction, you're going to be in trouble, right? Because you may like make something really dark and scary, and you're setting a mood, and then the creative director or a game designer comes in and goes like, "Oh, that was supposed to be light and fun, and you know, like an exciting place." And then you know, it's all like dark and gloomy. Like that doesn't work for me, right? So, so all of these things are really important. That the more you as an artist understand the the roles of game designers and what we do and how we function, um, the better you're going to make your art, right? And you're gonna you're gonna understand how to ask hard questions about form and function, right? And that's what's really important for you to, to get across. So, um, yeah, Jay, it's, um, 
the, the, the hard part in answering your question about, you know, going from, um, you know, just being an artist, like to be an art director or whatever, is, is to recognize that there's kind of a couple skill sets that, that are not generally fostered in lower level, um, you know, jobs. Even if you're in the job working for five or ten years, doesn't mean that you're going to be a good art director, right? If you're just even a lead artist. Um, I've seen a significant number of lead artists fail as they became an art director because those jobs are really different. Now, one of the things is in management. Um, you, you need to know how to manage people. You need to be good with people. Um, and that means great communication, right? And it doesn't mean that an art lead or, you know, somebody else doesn't need to have some communication skills, doesn't need to have some of that stuff in there. But an art director really, really needs to know how how that's all going to work. Um, and art director also, you know, um, needs to know how the rest of the game's kind of working, right? You, you need to have a bigger picture of like learning about like what's the overall creative direction, not just the art direction, but the creative direction, you know, in other words, what are the game designers going to be doing? What are my technical limitations? You know, what is my, um, um, engine capable of doing right when I'm, when I'm, um, you know, building out a model, like how complicated can it be? Those kind of things. So there's, there's a lot of things that, that um, affect you as an art director that, you know, you as an artist may just be like told, oh, go build a character, right? And you're, you don't really understand the context always about like, what's that character going to do? Where's he going to be? What's he, you know, all these other things. And they're kind of like, oh, don't worry about it. Just make me a character, right? Versus an art director is going to really be like, Okay, how does this character fit in? What are they doing? What's their skills and abilities? You know, they, they got to really make sure everything is is better understood there. An art director also quite often needs to work with outsource companies and, and be able to manage external teams, external resources, um, and things like that. And so that is also something that's um, that's really tricky to, to, to do. So I wish there was um, an easy way to tell you, like, how do you become a director? It takes a lot of experience. But it's also understanding, again, that it's a bigger picture um, of understanding what the whole visual look is going to be, how it's all going to be cohesive together. Um, and that's very different than, for example, I had an art director who got promoted from an art lead to an art director on one of my projects. And I ultimately you know, had to get rid of him um, because he would sit around in Unreal and work in shaders all day. And he would just try to get like the look of like one particular material like working just right and this game was somewhat photorealistic or somewhat you know realistic and, and look and he was always like why do I need to art direct this it's just a realistic game you know and so he just would sit around and like play with shaders which is what he did as an art lead you know and didn't realize that art directors need to be understanding you know your color palettes and you need to be understanding a lot of these things and how it all works together and you know again the, all of these big picture things that he just wasn't aware of and he just he couldn't wrap his head around it he just kept he was just comfortable working in um shaders and stuff all day and so ultimately we put him back as an art lead you know and um and just realized that you know he just wasn't really ready to be an art director and so that that direction is different right understanding composition form and function and you know colors and all these other things that a base artist might need to know but an art director really has to be able to nail like a style guy it has to know how to you know, again, put that all together. Same thing if you're like an engineer, it's that same thing like a uh, software architect or somebody that you know, architects things is, you know, needs to know how all these things fit together versus if you're just a programmer, you know, you might just be working on one little system. They're like, okay, you make this gun work, okay? You make running work, you make, you know, this work versus, you know, the CTO or, you know, a technical director or somebody might be like, okay, we're going to have a thousand systems and here's how they all fit together and here's all these things, right? You got to be able to see that big picture as you get into a director level. So, Patriot, how are you doing? So what does it take to be a successful indie game developer? It It's a really broad question, so I don't know exactly how to answer it because really each genre of game, each type of game, um... And I would say each studio is different, right? Um, and so there's not a way to, there's not an easy way just to, to quantify and say, you know, like, hey, do this, you know, be a successful indie developer, right? I mean, successful one is a very vague word in our industry. Um, 
So I would say that if you if you quantify success, meaning you're going to have enough sales and enough money to stay in business, you know, ultimately, you know, in the end, and that you know, that's a whole different problem than if you're, um, you know, trying to win awards or or whatever, right? And so so that so each indie indie studios can have a slightly different, um, you know, take on their stuff. Also, the the budgets that an indie studio works with can be all over the place. And so a successful studio is somebody, in my mind, that can get a game done on time, on budget if they have one, or at least in a reasonable manner, if you're doing it nights and weekends even, um, that, you know, that you're capable of, of doing that, right? And that you can put that out nights and weekends and you're successful at, at, at that, right? You, you don't want to spend 10 years making a game, even if it's like a mod to something, right? Like, a, So an indie studio needs to be responsible to be able to get things done, get things out. And that can be challenging when you're when you're not quite sure what you're making, don't have a lot of money, you know, those kind of things. So you start cutting a lot of corners and then that, you know, leads to a lot of other problems, right? And um, so, you know, it's, um, um, so it's, it is a challenge, um, you know, but I think, you know, as a successful um, um, indie developer, you you really just kind of have to look and see like, okay, what's the competition? What are they going to do? What do we have that's, you know, that's comparable? Um, and I don't care whether you're doing it for free, you know, as an indie doing, trying to make a game for free, meaning like nights and weekends versus, you know, an indie developer might have a $5 million budget. You know, you don't know. There's not really... A hard line that says this is an indie this one's not right like there's a lot of gray in there um and so again no matter what your budget your team or whatever it's going to be you know the, the 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 metrics for success is getting something out with you know and then be able to profit off of it right so even if i spend a million dollars and i still kind of create a indie game um you know if i don't make at least a million dollars then i totally failed right now if i make two million that would be maybe considered successful, right? But that's, you know, something that's different. So, you know, and then if you are, and then you, you say indie game developer, you know, so, you know, if you want to do games all by yourself, which I don't recommend, it's too multifaceted. And I really highly stress that, you know, I think 99.9% .9 of the people should not attempt to make a game by yourself, you know, unless it's just a really, 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 really simple game. And I know guys that do it, you know, and you can, but you've got to be really good because you got to know art, you got to know programming, you got to know game design, you got to know audio, you got to do writing, you got to do so many things, right? And those are not all a bunch of trivial skills that you can just you know do anytime, right? So that's something to be to be aware of. So um, hopefully that answers your question, Patriot. Um, so Jay again, um, thanks for inside Troy. Just said. Um, I did some research and a bachelor's degree is usually recommended to be an art director. Do you think this is necessary or suggested? I would say it's just suggested. There may be um, a few studios that do recommend it. I mean, whether you're a game designer, whether you're an artist, whatever, engineer, having a four-year degree and having GEs is not a bad idea. Like, there's nothing wrong with that. But the problem is that most of those schools are not really truly teaching you the real skills you need to, to, to really get a successful job, you know, when it's all said and done. So the companies, in my personal opinion, that are asking you if they require you to have a bachelor's degree to get a job, you know, in the, in the industry as an art director or something, I think they're old school and probably don't know what's really going on. It really is about your portfolio and it's about your skills. But again, do not expect to get an art director job fresh out of college, right? You're, you got to, earn that you've got to start off as an artist and then become an art lead and then become an art director you know and so on and so forth and rise that ladder, you know grow up that ladder and through that proving yourself um that's i mean and so once you get your foot in the door nobody's going to care what your degree is um so don't feel like obligated that you got to go like you know get a get a bachelor's degree but you've got to have just a amazing portfolio right and that's something that that's there and you just gotta have no you gotta really know how to get it done and that's the one you know i i don't like to preach cg spectrum here on my channel this is not about trying to get you guys to come to cg and you know and get you guys involved there but i do you know think it's a great school in that you know all of our guys 
that are here teaching are all guys who work in the industry. They're all guys that have, you know, an amazing, um, you know, um, background. And so you learn kind of really how it is, you know, versus you can go to some schools and, you know, they're, they're going to be a bunch of guys that are a bunch of academics and they may like, here's how you draw, right? And it's like, yeah, but how do I apply that in the games? And how do I do that? Like, it, it doesn't always align, right? And so, so just because you got a piece of paper doesn't make you a better artist or a better art director, right? In the end, you prove yourselves, uh, you know, through your portfolio. And, um, and, and same thing with a game designer. Um, now, engineers, I would say, are the one that gets a little bit stickier. Um, that still is like, can you prove what you can do? And if you've built a bunch of games, you can show them you built those games, you can get around some of the, I guess we'll call it the criteria or whatever of, um, of needing to have a degree. But I would say there, there's probably a higher chance if you're an engineer wanting to get into games that you might have, a, might really need a bachelor's degree um, to get in there and, you know, and work. But again, a lot of schools are really, really, really theory based. You know, and so even in engineering, even with a CS degree these days, I mean, who knows what you're, what you're going to do and, you know, and what you're going to get. Um, you know, I have, um, I've been consulting or was last year with some, some really major universities, some of the biggest in the U.S. Um, about their game design program. You know, and it was amazing to me that, you know, their computer lab was running, you know, computers that were seven years old and the software they were using was already four years old. So basically, you're starting day one learning software that's already four years old. So by the time you graduate, that software is already eight years old. Um, how are you ever going to get a job, right? Like, so just going to a major university and getting a degree in game design or game art is not going to guarantee you that you're going to get a job, right? You got to show them that you're using the latest tools, the latest techniques, the latest processes, and you understand the pipelines, that you got great communication skills, that you actually got the skill, you know, to do it and things like that. So don't feel like it's got to, that you've got to have that degree. Um, one last example there, um, I have to talk about is is one of my friends, Joel Emsley. Um, Joel, you know, um, went on to become um, an art director. He is currently an art director on this little game called Call of Duty. Um, and, you know, and he, he is um, arguably one of the best art directors, you know, in the world these days, or at least one of the highest profile art directors in the world. And I was one of the guys that brought Joel into the industry. And I hired him fresh out of high school. And he knew no 3D, there was nothing there, but he was the most amazing 2D artist, painter I'd ever seen in my life. I recognized his talent. Um, and we hired him, you know, and he was like, should I go even off to art school, you know, and go off to college? And we're like, hell no, come work for me. Like, we'll teach you the rest of the skills. You know, fast forward 20 years now, and Joel's the most amazing guy you've ever met in your life, you know, and, and he went from, again, being the high school kid never going to college never getting an art degree to now being an art director on arguably the biggest game in the world so you know um and joel's an exceptional talent you know but again it didn't a piece of paper you know with a degree did not make joel an art director joel made himself an art director um both in his skills and abilities and willing to learn things and in time in the trenches and you know starting at the bottom and working his way way up um so just keep that in mind that, again, degrees in our industry don't mean a whole heck of a lot. So, um, so Patriot, right now I'm currently making a 2D Final Fight clone in Unity. I outsource some coding and some concept art. It's getting it out and monetizing it that puzzles me. Should I talk to publishers? Um, so, Patriot, it's a hard question if it's on mobile um, versus on, you know, PC or whatever. Um, it's a slightly different process. Um, in the mobile world, um, one of the downsides in the mobile world that I hate right now is that most mobile publishers um, will not talk to you unless your game has been, is completed and has been live somewhere, at least in open beta for a minimum of six months, has KPIs and has things like that. Then they might talk to you about some funding, some things like that. So, so getting funding from a publisher in mobile is almost impossible, um, in my opinion. And, I, and I've taken games with big licenses 
that were basically done, you know, and I'd even soft launched one of my games in Korea, and um, we still, I mean, we did decent KPIs and things like that in Korea, and again, huge license on this game, everything else, and we still couldn't get published, you know, and get and get the final money for marketing and stuff. So don't expect you as a single individual to be able to get any money out of a publisher. I, I'd say it's that one in a million chance, you know, to... to to, to do it. So it really just depends on, you may be able to get it out and you're going to have to research kind of how do you, how do you get an indie game out, right? And how do you promote it? Stuff like that. That's, that's the trick. And that's a, that's a complicated thing that every game is a little bit different on. Every platform is a little bit different on how you approach steam versus mobile. You know, that kind of thing is, is very different. So I wish there was a, an answer. I wish I even knew half the time because, you know, getting my own projects funded sometimes can be a nightmare. So, McCullough, um, what what does come first? A character or a concept of the gameplay for that character? Like, what do you think about first? Do you apply a character's abilities to design or design after abilities? Um, in all honesty, it can go both ways. Um, I, I like to give my concept artists and my art teams freedom to explore and experiment and trying to understand, um, um, you know, what's going to be cool, right? So I may have a universe um, that's new and original and something that I created, or it could be something like Star Wars, you know, and they're kind of in a box. They got to develop, you know, certain things and can only use certain things, whatever. Um, and so there's a time and a place for an artist to say like, whether it's a character or a world or a building or a car or a gun or whatever it is to be able to like, Hey, I've got a great idea. I just got something that looks really, really, really cool and to be able to take that to a designer, and then the designer goes like, oh, wow, that's really cool too. Like, okay, let's now make a character in the game, you know, that, that, that you know, has the, that, that makes sense, that fits the drawing, right? So now I can go back and say like, well, this guy's really thin, so he looks like he moves really fast, he's lightly armored, but he's got some, you know, huge sword, so now I'll make him a sword guy, and, you know, and the designer can, can take your drawing and adapt it, right, into something possibly. But again, as long as it fits the IP, you gotta make sure it's consistent, you gotta make sure that your drawings and your ideas are gonna fit the universe. Because I definitely have been on a lot of projects where the art team had a lot of freedom, and, and this is not a good, this is not a good thing, and I'm, I am attempting today to not name names of studios and, and, and some of the ones that were nightmares in my existence, um, but the the studios, the, the, the teams were very siloed, right, and so a siloed team is basically one that doesn't communicate outside of itself, doesn't care to, doesn't want to, and, you know, and generally will tell you to kiss off if you're, you know, if I'm a game designer trying to tell the artist what to do, you know, that, that siloed team might be protected and be like, nah, we're going to do what we want to do. And so I definitely have had projects where I just threw things away. You know, the artists were like, hey, here's some new characters. And you're like, like you're like, you're doing Wild West characters and this is a sci-fi game. Like, what, what were you thinking? That like didn't, didn't even begin to fit the theme of the game. And they're like, whoa, we just thought like Wild West would be kind of cool. And you're like... But, you know, if you're doing a alien, you know, or Cowboys versus, what was it, Cowboys versus Aliens or Cowboys versus Predator, there was that one, you know, sometimes you, you might have a mashup movie that had, you know, Cowboys and Aliens together or whatever. Um, but, you know, or a, a Cowboyish sci-fi character. I mean, there, there's a time and a place, but it's got to look good. But you don't just take a character from like the 1800s and then throw him into a sci-fi world and be like, hey, look, he fits. Like, eh, no, like... So, but on the same hand, so my, my preferable methodology, what I attempt to try to do is at least do, if I'm going to do a character, I do maybe a half a page to one page text description of what I want that character to be. Um, do I want him, you know, what are his movement capabilities? How fast is he supposed to move? You know, how strong is he? Um, you know, what his personality type is, you know, what his race maybe is, what kinds of armor he might be wearing. Does he have like interchangeable pieces? Um, you know, any of that kind of stuff. And I'll try to detail that out in text, you know, and then, um, in the, and then once the text is, um, done, then I'll hand that to an artist. Then the artist can kind of be free to like experiment with it. But again, I usually tell the artist like, hey, you got some freedom here. You got some flexibility generally. Now, again, a licensed IP or something, 
might not have as much freedom, may not be have complete, you know, do whatever you want to do, but you know, that's what you have to like get them to understand what's important. Right. And so, um, so again, Macola, like you can kind of go both ways and how it is. And there's not a right or wrong answer, but again, I find that a concept artist generally will be happier and do better if you give them some guidelines for what they're supposed to make. Um, versus just saying, make me 10 aliens. And they're like, uh, where do I start? Are they big? Are they small? Are they fast? Are they, you know, whatever. Like, how, like, and they get confused, right? And so, so as a creative director, game designer type, that's something I, you know, I do attempt to do. So, um, yeah, I mean, um, so... Whether you're approaching the job as an artist or as a game designer or, again, as an engineer, you know, that stuff, you know, the, the more that you can understand each other's worlds, the better we're going to be, right? The, the more options we're going we're gonna to have and the more that we're going to understand. And I think that's the, that's the biggest challenge that we need to, um, um, to kind of figure out is what do we need from this project, from this team, from these people, you know, to make it a, a great place to, to work. All right. Now we're about 45 minutes in and answering questions. And again, please guys, like, um, if you've got more questions, um, um, chime up. I'm happy to, that's what today is about. Um, again, you know, being my birthday today and thank you everybody for the happy birthday wishes. Um, you know, Today's kind of casual, and we're going to chat about now, kind of get in a little bit into the, um, you know, the, 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 some of the stories and some of the stuff, and just kind of tell you guys about some projects. And I think, um, you know, in my first company at Roan Entertainment, when I was there, you know, I spent almost six years there, um, and, you know, we worked on games like Armor Command and Bruce Lee, and, you know, we had a bunch of original IPs. Um, we worked on you know, Star Wars Force Commander, which is a pretty bad, um, pretty bad game. But you know, it's it is what it is. Um, you know, it's interesting to see that you know all these companies, all these projects, always had design. You know, things that we had to worry about, things that we that we needed to to, to struggle with, right? Um, like on Armor Command, um, when I was working on that. Um, as a game designer, some, some of my challenges were, were interesting to kind of show you like where things are today versus where they were, you know, 20 something years ago. Um, you know, DirectX was not around. And so if you don't know what DirectX is, um, DirectX is part of the Microsoft ecosystem. And it was basically, a, it's a series of, I'll call them drivers and things that allow, you know, allows, um, developers and, and hardware device people to, basically have stuff that works better together and utilizes all that stuff better. So, you know, be able to do like a 3D game engine, you know, it has to go through DirectX. Um, you know, mouse and keyboard input, sound, you know, input, output, you know, all that stuff. All those things go through DirectX now. So that allows you both in Windows and at least in the Xbox um, um, operating system architecture to work pretty easily because you don't have to do any of that work yourself. It just all works for you. Um, so DirectX is, is pretty important, you know, and it really did change our industry. It did help a tremendous amount, but that, you know, that's a relatively new, you know, in the grand scheme of things, a relatively new thing. Um, also, when we started Armor Command, there was no 3D accelerator card on the market. So you could do 3D-ish games, but you had to do what was called software rendering. And software rendering means that, you know, your your CPU basically, and maybe what a little bit of power that's in your graphics card, um, would allow you to, you know, create pseudo 3D worlds, but you really weren't drawing them as polygons. You really were, you know, kind of, it was hacking them together and kind of a, um, you know, through rendering, you know, within your game engine and then outputting a bunch of pixels. And that's a very, very different thing than, you know, in today's world where a 3D accelerator actually like takes your, your 3D polygonal objects and then builds them all out together and then renders it out at some frame rate. And that's what, you know, the, the 3D um, um, accelerators do. But when we started Armor Command, not a single one was on the market. 
you know, and so it was interesting as we started as a, as a, you know, software rendering, you know, only, and then maybe a quarter of the way or something into the project. I still remember, um, having, the uh, um, uh, three DFX guy visit and three DFX, if you guys don't know, was the very first three D accelerator and a whole bunch of others followed within that first year. In fact, I believe if I remember the number, right, I believe that armor command supported like over a hundred, even like about 120, different 3D accelerators, um, or at least different models, different variants, you know, and things like that. And so it was very interesting that when we when we were trying to, and this was, again, a DOS-based game, um, you know, and kind of the pre, pre-Windows, or at least Windows were just kind of starting to come, um, but a lot of stuff was based in DOS still, um, and it's kind of right on that cusp of things. And um, so we didn't have DirectX yet. And either and so we had to figure out 3d rendering um, and that was really hard on the design and then from the design standpoint one of the hardest things that we tackled and, and failed and didn't solve was we couldn't figure out you know again in kind of DOS and in this 3d accelerator world how to have my mouse and keyboard or my mouse work in the 3d world like be able to select units and things like that and then be able to transition that over to a 2D menu. So like, you know, if you had some build buttons, so let's just say I built, you know, select a unit that could, you know, have a special attack or had a build command or whatever. I couldn't select that unit in the 3D world and then click on a 2D interface that said, hey, now, you know, now um, build this unit, right? Or now launch this special attack or, you know, do or heal or something like that. So I couldn't click both in the 3D world and on the 2D interface. Um, we couldn't figure that out. Like, you know, these days it's trivial. Everybody does it. It's super easy. You know, it's not a big deal. And um, back then, even that technology um, didn't work. And so, so Armor Command got heavily criticized. We were the first, um, or one of the first um, 3D RTSs. And, you know, and people complain like, oh, well, the interface is a little wonky, blah, 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 you know, and then it was hard because you had to use the keyboard to control all of your user interface. So you'd have to kind of use the arrow keys and whatever, but it actually kind of worked pretty well. I mean, for all intents and purposes, considering how not be able to have the clickable UI, um, the keyboard stuff was pretty fast. It was pretty easy and it still wasn't half bad to, to, to use. And, um, but that was like the bane of my existence where I, I really couldn't do a lot of things in the game. We had to be really, really careful about like what can we do in the game um, because the, the, the 3D, the 2D, you know, back and forth didn't work. You know, and so I'm telling the story because a lot of times in games, you know, this is kind of an extreme example from the early days, the Dark Ages, and, you know, dinosaurs were roaming around bothering us while we programmed and stuff. But, um, you know, we... Um, the, whatever whatever we work on, whatever new platform it is, I don't care if you're going into VR or whatever, right? There's going to be problems that we encounter when we go to new platforms. So, for example, in VR, we had a lot, especially in the early days of VR, we had a lot of problems with, like, how do I locomote, you know, in the game? If I've got a first-person shooter and I've got my VR headset on, you know, and I'm trying to, you know, even be, especially before, like, the... the the, the six def controllers came out with all the, you know, the, the buttons and stuff on them, but still like, how do I move forward and how do I walk in a game? And, you know, and there was this weird disconnect between, you know, um, as I started to get into room scale stuff where I could have sensors and I got to like, do I walk in a room and I trip over something and I hurt myself and, you know, do I use a stick here? But there was a, there was a weird like disconnect there. Um, UI interface menus again were tricky and things like that. So, so every platform we work on or and i assume every platform that we'll ever work on is going to have nuances and it's going to have problems in the technology side that if you don't work with your engineering team you know if you're an artist or a designer you're going to be in a lot of trouble you're going to have a lot of problems you know and so you need to to kind of be like whoa okay i gotta you know um really think about like what are my limitations what can my team do what can technology do because we could have tried to put a lot of extra resources onto, say, solving that 3D to 2D UI problem on Armor Command, but what would that have cost us, right? Like, you know, maybe that was a solvable problem. I don't know at the time, um, you know, but the um, but we have to kind of say like, okay, if that's going to take us six man months to do, if I 
solve that one problem, which is annoying. Maybe, it, you know, I, I can't do three more levels in the game or something, right? And then, you know, maybe that has a, a higher chance of, like, killing, um, killing the project than, um, you know, making the games, you know, a little bit better, right? Um, you know, or, or, or making the, the 2D to 3D work. So, so just be aware of that. Like, the, the games and game design are always about the trade-offs. So that's something you kind of have to know. All right, a few more questions here. Um, so Jay, New York City, um, or just um, best cities in general? There is some developers in New York. I mean, it is a little bit limited, um, but there definitely is developers there. So you're not, you know, um, you're not completely out of luck as far as finding a local company to work with. Um, as far as the hubs, you know, um, these days it's, you know, it's Vancouver, it's Seattle, Toronto, um, you know, um, of course the Bay Area, Los Angeles, San Diego a little bit, um, Austin, Texas now, a little bit in Dallas, um, you know, um, obviously North Carolina now with Epic and all kind of the spinoffs there. There's a little bit in New York, um, you know, and then a few other cities have, you know, have some okay communities, um, you know, and so it really just depends on kind of where you want to go, what kind of lifestyle you want. Um, though I have to say that, you know, with COVID, a lot has changed and the world's not quite the same place, you know, in game development that it used to be. And so don't, you know, you don't know these days, like, like how many companies now are completely straight work from home? Um, quite a few. Right, and so so just be aware of that, that that there's nothing stopping you from looking for more remote positions, and you could be working for a company in Europe, you know, and be living in New York, right? So so you really kind of have to to I think evaluate things a little bit differently today because I think the world in the last year or so is you know has really changed a lot. So um, and that's why I wouldn't I wouldn't say that there's a better or worse place. Um, and again, game design is a very big, you know, and very broad thing. So if you're more into console or a certain kind of game, you may want to be at a certain company. Um, you know, the Bay Area has got tons of companies, um, and it's really nice, but it's also really expensive here, right? Where I, I live in the Bay Area. Um, so yes, tons of companies here, tons of opportunities here. There's everything from startups to EA and everything in between, um, you know, but, you know, it comes at a cost, right? I mean, Bay Area is a beautiful place to live. I love it here, but, you know, it is a little on the pricey side. Um, so it just depends on the what lifestyle you want, right? What's going to make you happy? You know, and that's what being a game designer, you know, is kind of, kind of all about. All right. So, um, well, I think what I'm trying to think of the best format to talk about here. So let me talk a little bit first about what it's going to be like, or what it's like to be a kind of a smaller, more indie, and I'll say indie or independent, because again, there's a there's a distinction between a company that's doing, say, ballpark. Let's just let's just say anything under a million dollars is what we would consider indie in their development budget. You know, anything over you know under about you know fifteen or so million typically would it be an independent, you know, project. So again, those may have a publisher, those may have, you know, other things, but they're not, um, they're not big AAA. They're next, not the next Call of Duty, but that, that A to AA space, you know, is kind of that like typically million to, you know, $10 million kind of range to kind of give you a sense of that. Um, a single, um, indie studio could be a single person um but more often than not it's probably at least five um and it can be 25 i mean there really isn't a again these things do not have really hard definitions you know these things are are very kind of give and take um so you know that's why you, you can't there, there's not a a standardized way to kind of say like what what it is it like well let me kind of tell you guys because for example, I'm working at a couple studios right now and working with some, um, oh, thank you, Elijah. I appreciate it. Take care. Um, um, you know, what is it like to, 
be at a smaller company, right? Let's talk about that for a little bit. And I think that might be a good way to segment this a little bit. So when you're at a small, let's say indie studio, right? Your, your budgets are really, really, really low. Um, and, you know, and you're basically not going to have a very big team, you know. So unless by some chance you get, you know, an opportunity to, um, to for whatever reason, something that's, you know, if you get an opportunity to, to work on, you know, an indie game, you might, it excites a lot of people. And maybe you'll get 20 guys that are all going to volunteer and work on it, right? But they're probably not all volunteering full time and all these other kinds of things, right? So, so let's just assume we're, you know we're at a five or ten person company. What's what's the difference there? Like what? How's that? How's that experience? So like now at Ronin we were maybe in the like 40, 50 range for a lot of the time I was there. But when I first got there, I was the first full time employee, and I think we had some contractors, maybe eight people, something like that. And then like I said, I I've been in and out of a lot of startups, you know, and smaller companies there. And as a game designer. How's it, what, what's that experience like, right? So let's talk about that. So one of the challenges, you know, in a smaller team is you have to be a lot more of a jack of all trades, you know, usually, right? And so again, there, there's always exceptions to the rule. There's always, you know, um, you know, you might be on a team that had three game designers, for example, and, and whatever. And so maybe you each specialize. You know, but that's not as common, right? You know, the, the more common route is that the smaller team, more people have to wear more hats, you know, because you're not going to be able to be like, hey, Joe, can you do this? And hey, Frank, can you do this? And hey, Steve, can you do this? Right? You're like, uh, somebody's got to do it. And I guess it's me, right? And that's the way we have to kind of think about these things, right? So, um, so when you're, when we are looking at, smaller indie teams, um, as a game designer, you know, quite often I'm the guy that, you know, is probably coming up with an idea all the way to, you know, scoping it out, writing the design documents, you know, and, and then probably even building a, a, a lot of the prototype myself, you know, I may or may not have an engineer to help me, you know, and so I might be doing, you know, working on Unity or Unreal or these days at least, and, um, trying to build, something that somebody can see that somebody can you know see if that's fun see if they like it you know and i may or may not have artists helping me i might be like having to buy assets on the you know on the asset store somewhere and use some pre-existing assets or maybe i'm outsourcing some of that stuff and I'm, you know, I'm bringing these things all together right but the biggest challenge in these small teams is what can i do for what our budget is going to allow me to do right and i think that's where it gets the hardest, not to say that isn't hard on bigger budgeted teams. If I have 10, 20, 50, a hundred million dollars, each one of those steps, things change a lot, right? But if I've got $50,000, you know, I don't have a lot of wiggle room to be like, well, I'll just go through a guy for a couple of years on that problem. Let's see, you know, how it resolves, you know, when I'm paying somebody a hundred thousand dollars a year, um, you know, I don't want to have to, you know, delay an extra couple months, right? Or delay an extra year or whatever, because that's going to, you know, could potentially ruin my company. And so, you know, as a smaller developer, that's just something you have to to um, really think through. And so one of the things that Ronan that allowed me to kind of do what I did there was that I was able to do a vast majority of, not all of, but a vast majority of, kind of the, the tactical programming, scripting kind of stuff, the, the art production, the game designs, you know, and those kind of things all myself. And so I could kind of usually put together a lot of like a, we'll call it prototypes, things like that, you know, a first playable um, without a whole lot of extra help. And so my, my job became kind of this perpetual pitch guy where I'm constantly coming up with a new idea. And then we try to like use that to open the door and then go do like business development with, you know, a publisher and be like, hey, buddy, let's go talk. Like, I got something to show you, right? And um, and that's part of the, you know, the overall experience that you need to kind of figure out. Like, what what is that experience that, that you want, you know, um, the, let's say the, you know, the, the player to have. And can me as a game designer put that all together myself, you know, or do I need to have a lot, you know, a big team, you know, behind me, right? 
So, you know, it's definitely a lot more challenging, um, but it's also very rewarding. But you got to re remember that you got to have some art skills, you got to have some technical skills, you got to have some game design skills, and, and probably a thousand other skills. Like, even be all like, hey, I got to throw music in the game. Like, okay, how do I put music in the game, right? So, those kinds of things um, are can be really important and really fun, you know, fun to do, right? But it's still. Um, could be a challenge. So, hold on one second, guys. I'm out of liquid, and let me just, since I'm doing all this talking, let me um, be right back in just two seconds. All right, sorry about that. Back, everybody. Ah, a little dry today, so keep my keep my throat going. Um, and so again, like you know, that experience as a game designer, it's great. I get to work on a lot of different things. You get to work on a lot of different projects. You get to kind of be involved, kind of from start to finish. Um, you know, I'm doing you know, coming up with an idea to like building the game systems to you know to everything that's involved in that. And, you know, I really like that. You know, for me, I got to learn a whole lot of stuff. And you, and you get to do, you know, in those positions, you know, we didn't really have a, a concept of a creative director. I mean, for all intents and purposes, I kind of was the creative director, you know, on most of the projects. Um, you know, back then, our teams were kind of small. And, you know, we didn't, you know, we may or may not have called me or, or used that, but that was kind of, in essence, kind of what you what you are, right? You know, being that person that's the creative lead. And for me, what I really enjoyed about these projects is I get to know um, a lot about a lot of different things. And so, for example, I love Star Wars. You guys can see Boba Fett sitting here next to me. He's keeping me company. Um, and, um, you know, a huge fan of Boba Fett and just Star Wars in general. Um, so I got to work on a bunch of Star Wars games, you know, when I worked at Ronin. And that was, you know, an incredible experience. Um, I got to work on a Bruce Lee game, you know, and haven't always been somebody that was a fan of Bruce Lee. And, you know, and I, I went and even studied Jeet Kune Do and actually learned, you know, martial arts, you know, from one of Bruce's um, students, you know. And I got to know his wife and his, and his daughter, Shannon, and many things like that, right? And so, you know, this job also just requires just a lot of, like, constant research. Each new project, you're learning new things and you're, and you're, and you're studying things. And so... Like with the Bruce Lee game, um, in fact, I'll pull it off the shelf here. So this was the Bruce Lee Quest of the Dragon, if anybody ever ever saw this for the original Xbox. Um, this was kind of a, a crazy project. Um, but, you know, we, you know, not only did we have to learn a lot about Bruce, you know, and Jeet Kune Do and all of his philosophies and his styles, but his daughter Shannon, you know, helped us write it. And, you know... And it turned out that the story that we ended up going with was actually an original story that Bruce himself wrote before he died. And so we actually were able to take that story that was designed for a movie script, um, adapt it into a game with Shannon's help, and um, and that story, you know, became part of the part of the Bruce Lee, you know, legend. But the original story came from Bruce. You know how much you know how cool is that, right? So so that's something that you know is. Um, really fun is the job of a game designer when you're getting to work on these projects and I'm you know going to all these martial arts conventions and meeting you know all of Bruce Lee's students and all the people that are studying Jeet Kune Do and I'm studying it and just learning a lot about it and things like that and so for me as a game designer I've really enjoyed that that every one of my projects for the most part has given me opportunities to work with just absolutely amazing people you know I've got to work with you know Famous writers, famous directors, famous you know movie stars, um, 
you know, things like that, you know, get to work with, you know, famous musicians, um, you know, hanging out with Slash, hanging out with, you know, Zach Wilde, hanging out with, you know, all these different, you know, rock star guys and actually being friends with them and actually, you know, getting to a point where these guys, I mean, a lot of these guys would call me up and we'd go out to dinner and, you know, and for years, like, hang out with them and, and you know, and be friends with them and not just, you know, somebody you work with, right? Um, getting to hang out with, you know, when I, I worked on a, um, the original version of what was called Mercenaries and the ODA and, you know, and like, we hired um, John Milius um, to, to write the script, you know, co-author the script with me. And that um, John Milius, if you don't know, was the original writer and director of Conan. He worked on, a, he wrote Apocalypse Now, Saving Private Ryan, you know, um, all the Dirty Harry movies, um, I think Platoon, like all these big movies um, John Milius was the creator of, you know, or writer of, or something on, you know, and like, I mean, how amazing an experience for me to be able to like be able to just be in the same room and then suddenly to call these guys friends and have them calling me up and, you know, and like wanting to hang out and, and stuff. And, you know, as a game designer, that's that's also been something that's been a really amazing experience. But it's something that our kind of normal everyday world, you know, crosses into a lot of media, right? Whether it's movies, TV, games, um you know, and other game developers to um, music industry, um, writers, again, like all these things. And you, you just get to work with just so many incredibly talented people and things like that. But, but you also have to kind of like, you know, learn how to manage the talent, you know, and stuff like, and even, you know, and even silly stuff. Like when I worked on the, um, this TNA wrestling game here. Um, so like Kurt Angle, um, in the middle, and then like Samoa Joe over here, and a bunch of these guys, um, um, AJ, who's flying through the air up here. Um, you know, for the two years that I worked on that project, it was a wrestling game, you know, and I, I had never watched wrestling. I will never ever watch wrestling again. It's not something that I want to do, but I spent two years watching wrestling almost every night, you know, and learning everything there was to do about wrestling. And um, on one hand, not my most favorite thing that I had to do. But I really enjoyed hanging with these guys and getting to know them and having them call me and hang out with me and you know and I'd go watch them you know in Florida you know film all their their TV shows and you know getting to know these guys and respect them as human beings respect them as athletes and stuff whereas before I kind of just saw them as this person on TV that just did male soap opera right and getting to like hang out with these guys and they, you know and I thought game developers were really immature that we were you know a, a play a lot of pranks and do a lot of stuff. And have a lot of fun, and we were nothing compared to those guys. Those guys were just like crazy, um, crazy guys. It was just it was just so much fun just watching them horse around and you know and, and getting to know them, and just you know and people like Samoa Joe were just like hilarious. And I just had so much fun like hanging out with those guys and going out to dinner with them, and you know and really again getting to kind of know them, you know, at a different level. And and so that's been one of the the fun parts of the job. Um, and again, like. Games like Band Fuse, things like that, getting to work with a lot of the, the celebrity talents and, you know, working with people like Slash and Zach Wilde. Um, Zach's the guitarist for Ozzy Osbourne, um, you know, and um, especially the guys, um, Five Finger Death Punch. Whoops, hard to see on here. The guys from Five Finger Death Punch and, and George Lynch, who was already a friend of mine, and some of these guys. Um, getting to work with these guys was just incredible. And, you know, and, and it was... Again, a lot of fun because even people like Zach Wilde, who was, you know, a, a hero of mine. Like, I mean, you know, it's somebody I, I, I mean, I always idolized. I mean, he's a, a film guitarist for Ozzy. And, like, Zach, you know, Zach called me Brother Troy. And, like, I would get 2 a.m. drunk texts from him all the time. Like, hey, Brother Troy, what's going on? What are you up to? Like, you know, and I'd go over to his house and hang out, you know. And so is a, is a, um, um, <laughs> touched his hair. That's <laughs> pretty funny. Yes, he does have quite the quite the mane of hair. Um, but they're just amazing people, right? And, and and getting to like really hang out and get to get to know them, right? And you know, you know, I got to go to like Zach's house. I mean, he's got thousands of guitars, and you know, 
Um, he has the original Randy Rhodes guitar that Randy played, and I got to sit and play it, and you know, and all these things, and you know, and stuff like that. And like, and so as a game designer, like we we get these experiences. Our our lives are like totally different, right? And that doesn't mean that every game designer is going to get that experience. If you're if you're just working on Halo, for example, or whatever, you might be doing an original IP, and you're just going to be like in your thing. Even if you're the top guy on Halo, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to go work with talent, right? Now, if you're going to do a Halo TV show or whatever, then maybe you get to work with some external talent. Maybe you hire a, a, a well-known sound designer or a writer or somebody that you do get to work with or whatnot. You never know. And, um, you know, it's funny because, like, in some cases, like, a lot of the, a lot of the even Hollywood people I've worked with, some funny stories. So I, I worked at a company called Brash Entertainment, it for a long time and at brash we did all movie license games and um and so i was working on maybe i don't remember total like maybe a dozen or so movie movie based games and like we were doing a game called album of the chipmunks which is definitely not what i'm proud of <laughs> like as far as a game it was definitely you know probably one of the lowest of my of my like i'm not going to admit to many people unfortunately i just admitted it to you guys that i worked on it um, but, um, you know, as a game, yeah, not the best, but what was fun was like, I had to do all the, you know, I had to do all the VO recording. And so I, I often have to work with a lot of celebrities and stuff to do the VO and things like that. And it was really funny to walk in and our whole company or a bunch of people are there and we walked in and, um, Jason Lee, if you guys know who he is, the star, you know, who was the star of Alvin and the Chipmunks and he did like clerks and a bunch of other stuff. And, um, Jason's a friend of mine. And so it was really funny, like walking in here and the whole company is there. And then Jason sees me and he runs over and gives me a big hug. And everybody is like, what in the heck? You know, and it's like, how do you know him? You know, kind of thing. And it was just coincidental, you know, and it was really funny because then the, the next day, um, the same group of people were all, we were doing the VO for another game called Jumper. Um, and, um, in Jumper um, stars Rachel Bilson, and Rachel, um, she was from the OC and a bunch of other things. Um, beautiful, beautiful girl. She was kind of like, I think, Maxim, you know, list for some of those, one of the most beautiful women in Hollywood kind of thing. And um, same thing, I walked in, Rachel saw me, comes running over and gives me a big hug. And, and, um, and all the guys were like, what? <laughs> like, how do you know all the talent? And turns out Rachel's the daughter of one of my close friends. So, you know, it just... Small world in those cases, but it just they're, they're just fun stories. They're just fun experiences and the things you get to work with. Or, you know, like on Rainbow Six Vegas, you know, getting to work with, you know, like we had, you know, nobody's name that you would know. But, you know, we worked with Mossad, like military advisors and things like that. And just the crazy stories we get and the, 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 the stuff. And you're like, you're making that up, right? Like that didn't really happen, you know. And they're like, no, 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 no. Like it really did happen. And. And stuff and just just crazy stuff. Same like I talked about John Milius earlier. Like he would tell stories about like Apocalypse Now and being on set there. And I mean, you're just like you, you know, if I didn't know him better, I would have thought he was lying. Like it was just like no, that couldn't have happened, right? Like really, <laughs> like those kind of things. And so a lot of our world crosses into these other worlds, right? And I'm saying this for a reason is because what we need as game designers to be aware of the talent. We need to be aware of the things that um, are important to us, right? And um, so, you know, that's the kind of stuff that we as designers um, um, need to figure out, you know, um, how to deal with, how to work with, like, how do we work with a famous writer? How do we work with, you know, I've worked with George Lucas and Spielberg and all these kinds of people. Like, how do you work with those kinds of people, right? And that's, that's a lot of the... The fun, you know, in our in our job, right? That's a lot of things that, that really make our job interesting, and that's you know something that's that's exciting. And so, um, anyways, you know, it's um to me that's like where a lot of fun is in the job, where a lot of the adventure has been, is that that just the getting to work with those you know those external people has been you know has been a lot of fun. Um, but again, it's a skill set that we have to sort of understand. We have to we have to know how do we do things, you know, that way, right? Especially when you're working at a big company or you're working at a small company. But like, how do you 
manage that day to day. And then it becomes even more complicated if you do, you know, a little bit of a tangent here, but I'm I'm just rambling today, so put up with put up with me. <laughs> the, um, but the um, um, you know, I've worked on probably more movie licensed games than almost anybody. You know, I definitely have, I've worked on probably over twenty movie licensed games. You know, and you know, again, I mentioned like Star Wars, and you know. Harry Potter and Lord of the Rings and Batman and, you know, all, all these different things and a lot of really bad ones. Superman and, you know, and Jumper and, you know, uh, the list goes on and on and on about all these movie licensed games that I've worked with, worked on. And that's been a, a really big part of my career. And, you know, you, you have to know, like, well, how do I, as a game designer, take something that's probably already existing, you know, and how do I, you know adapt it right and how do i deal with the the challenges like on a game um let's see if he's up here da, 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 da. um oh that's weird i do not see my box all right well i will not show it to you then um on a game um, called tales of despero um again when i was at brash you know i worked on this game called tales of despero and um tales had um you know, an interesting thing in that the um, um, the game was only going to take about 12 to 14 months to develop. The movie was about 24 months in this particular case to develop. Um, and the movie was way behind schedule. And so we got into a problem in that we needed to start building worlds. Um, yeah, so Tales of Pro became a movie and became a... Um, uh, uh, a couple games. We made a couple games out of it, but the movie was was pretty good. Um, games, eh? <laughs> you know, sorry, not too proud of those either. Um, but the um, but but Tales of Despero, you know, is a good example of a really challenging project that we we were working with a not so good developer, and um, we were already having a lot of problems there. Um, but one of the biggest challenges we had, you know, in, in Tales was um, about half of the movie takes place underground in what's called Rat World. You know, and Rat World um, is kind of like the underground. So um, Despero is a mouse, you know, and he's the good guy. And the, and the you know, and the, um, the rats are the bad guys, right? And they, they live underground. So kind of stereotypical story there. And... Um, but it got to a point where we needed to start building all the levels in Rat World. So like half of our game took place in Rat World. And we got we had to start production in order to get those done on time because we had to launch day and date with the movie. The problem was is, is that when we got to the point of needing to develop Rat World, they hadn't even started that in the movie. Like all they had was a script. They had not even started concepting Rat World yet. And so suddenly now we're like, oh my God, like how do we... How do we work, right? How am I supposed to work with this stuff? And I'm having to meet, you know, with the the director all the time. I'm having to meet with you know, all these people. And like, guys, like I need some help here. You know, it's like, what, you know, what do I do? Like, how how do I move forward, right? Like, what am I supposed to do as a game designer to 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 do this? And they told us like, well, just kind of like, why don't you go concept some stuff and see what you come up with? And in the end, like, our we did have a great concept guy, and he. He concepted some really good stuff, and then ultimately, uh, it turns out a lot of our concepts basically went into the movie because they got behind in production. And then, um, you know, especially because it was a full CG movie, so they were all allowed to do you know a bunch of that. And so, in our case, we helped design Rat World, um, but it was like this crazy thing where again, this chicken or the egg problem of like we needed to start something, we needed an amount of time to work on something, and um, and that's that can be a big challenge, right? So the, 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 the time schedules of TV shows and movies and games often do not align. They're often very, very different. Um, TV shows especially can be done really fast, depending on the show. Um, so another example was I was working on a on a project um, when I was at well I'm not I will not mention any names. <laughs> Just when I was at a when I was at a big company, you know, we, we were working with a um, a very famous uh, man, uh, a friend of mine named J. Michael Strakinsky. And Joe um, is the creator of a show, 
was the creator of a show called Babylon 5. And we were not able to get the rights to Babylon 5. Um, so Joe and I set off to create a spiritual successor to B5, um, which was going to be a 21-episode TV show that was going to be in sync with an MMO game. And we were going to film um, the TV show with multiple endings. And then the stuff and the events within the game would actually influence the TV show and vice versa. And so we were designing it such that the TV show, you know, would have outcomes that would change the stuff that was going on in the game and the game and even the player's actions in the game could actually affect the TV show likewise. And nobody had ever attempted to do this. I mean, this was back in like 2000, um, even, you know, um, I think before the Xbox even came out, you know, so very early days kind of in the game industry still um, when you're trying to do that trans, like true transmedia, you know, stuff, but it was really hard because we needed about 28 to 30 months minimum, probably really more like 36 months to do the game. Um, and Joe coming off B5 was like the master of like really fast production. Like that was one of his, one of his skill sets in building these things out. So he could build out like an entire episode. I mean, he could, once he had the scripts, like he could build and shoot like an entire show in like two weeks, you know? And so it was one of those things like 21 episodes was only like 40 weeks, you know, like, you know, and so it wasn't even a year, right? Like, I mean, maybe with post, he was talking like a year to get like his entire thing done, you know, and we needed like almost three times that. And so it became this like big problem and this chicken and the egg problem of like, okay, well, how do we get the game done? You know, when the, um, or how do you know we could shoot the TV show and then let it go sit for two years, you know, while we're trying to make the game to it? But then, like, how do we change things back and forth? And it just became a, a real nightmare, right? Ult ultimately, long story short, the project got canceled for some other reasons. But it's like those kinds of things are, are so tricky to f figure out. So when you talk about why there's so many really bad like movie license games um, and things like that, it's um, there's a lot of disconnect, you know, between the the, the game developers, excuse me, and the and the um, to the game developers and the TV movie, you know, producers. And so, so us as game designers are always caught in the middle, right? We're we're the people that we've got to learn how to work with the talent. We've got to like get our stuff approved. Now, I mean, the artists and stuff need to get their stuff approved too, but the game design can be challenging. Although I'd say the art, like when it comes to getting your art in some Depends on the project, but like, you know, um, in some IPs and some licensed universes, you know, they can be really, really, really picky about getting art approved, you know, because they want the visual look to be, they want a specific character to look really, look right. And they may pick on that more. And they may not be a game designer, so they may not know what it is, but you, you have to go get approvals for all of those things. So if you don't know, when you're working on a movie, or a TV, or any any kind of a license, we'll call it, right? I would say even music, whatever. Quite often, more often than not, they the owner of that license, the owner of the IP, um, again, movie, TV show, even a comic, or whatever it is, might have the rights to review everything. And they may have the right to, like, reject things. Um, and, some, and sometimes that gets really, really, really complicated. You know, and so you as a, as a game designer have to be really aware of this or even I'll say game developer because you know quite often you've got to submit things and then it has to go through this whole long approval process and then come back to you you know and then if they want any changes and you got to make some changes they go all the way back and get approved and it can it can lengthen your production cycle tremendously and it, it makes things so much harder and so much worse and and so you know, it's, it can be tricky. Like, another example, I'll, I'll tell a funny story. Um, I will not tell you, <laughs> again, who, who exactly was involved, but um, we were doing a very large game um, that was supposed to be the game for basically what that mo It was, you know, they're, they're one of the top, basically, three movie studios. Um, and and they were, we, were we were doing a game based on what was going to be or supposed to be their biggest movie of the year. Right, so this was a big game for a big movie, a big you know two hundred, I think it was about two hundred million dollar movie, you know production for the movie, um, fairly big budget for the game, 
all these kind of things. And the the movie was based on a book. Um, and so the author of that book is um, was involved. Um, and he helped write the script for the movie a little bit. Um, and then the the producer or director of the of the movie also um, helped write the script. Um, and that guy was a complete. I, I won't even tell you how crazy that guy was. I wish I could name some names and and, but it was. Um, let's put it this way: we, we went into the first script reading. I, I went in. I had to read the script for the movie. You know, in house at the studio. I wasn't even allowed to take the script home. You know, I had to go in and read it there. And um, I went in and I read the script, and it made no sense. Like it was the, the craziest. You know. Whatever, and we'd already signed the contracts. So we were already locked into doing this game, and I was—I looked at the script and was like, "Oh my god, this is the biggest mess ever!" And um, um, so I went and met with the producer and the director. And I literally said, "Like, who's this game for?" And uh, or who's sorry, who's this movie for? Like, and he said, "Oh, fourteen-year-old potheads." And I was like, "What?" <laughs> like, he literally was making this for teenage kids that were high, and like, and I was like. That makes sense because this movie made no sense whatsoever. So we we were day one off to off to the races like with this with this group. So not so every approval had to go through the the writer who was the original writer of the book who owned the original license had to go through this writer producer director guy who was always high. Um, and I never once met with him when he wasn't high. Um, and um, and then it was a huge move huge major movie studio um and for two years we worked on the game and every month we would submit parts of the game for approval and nothing ever got approved not once and they just ignored us basically and so for two years we just kept working on the game but kind of kept going guys we need approval we need approval nothing ever got approved so we legally can't ship the game until you know and we got down to a point where we had about two weeks left before we had to go to Microsoft and Sony, submit the game, you know, for their process to get onto the platforms if we were going to make a day and date ship, you know, to, to launch with the movie. And that was a requirement for us to, to do that. But we still had no approvals done from the from the publisher. Well, just so happens that one of our investors is on the board of directors of that movie studio. And so he called a meeting and um, I was in that meeting along with all the executives of this movie studio. Scary, scary position to be in. These are these are very, 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 very powerful people in Hollywood, right? These are not people, um, and they, they, they knew me. I mean, they're people I've been working with and, and talking to and all that. So they were aware of me, at least. Um, definitely not people that I was, you know, friends with, but, but kind of scary, big Hollywood people, right? And um, so... This guy who was on our board, you know, we were all sitting in the room waiting for him to 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 join the meeting to discuss the approvals because again we had two days now to get this game approved so we could ship it. And I'm sitting in this meeting with all these people and they're chatting and I'm just like shaking. I'm so nervous because they're just it's, it's such a room full of powerful people. And um, this executive from our board walked in the room and just said, "Everybody, shut up!" And you know, the whole room just went like deathly quiet he just said whatever Troy says is approved is approved and he walks out and um and you just see all their eyes and, th and this is like the CEO and people these are not low level people from the movie studio this was all the way from the CEO of the movie studio down like the top 10 people at the studio so th these were not like low level <laughs> people <laughs> and they all just looked at me and went okay it's approved you know and the game was proved and we launched. Um, but, you know, it's like, yeah, kind of kind of scary times. I was like, like literally shaking for a little while after that one. I was like, that was not the best experience. Um, but that's what happens, right? Like it's, you know, our world when you're dealing with approvals, you deal with all these things and, and stuff. And, and it gets even more complicated. Like if you don't know, like we have to have the image and likeness um, of a particular actor. So like, you know, if I... If I work on a particular movie and I need that, if I need that particular actor to um, to be in my, you know, to be in the game as well, 
um, I have to get the the rights, and I have to pay that actor to to be in my game, you know, and to be to be there as well. So just because I license a movie or a TV show does not give me the right to actually use that actor in the in the the game as well. So I have to pay extra. So if I want, you know, a, a character, if it's a human, now it's one thing if it's a made up character, right, or a character like like take even Boba Fett for example, right. Like, because he's got a mask, I mean, Disney or Lucas owns the rights to Boba Fett. You know, you don't know who the actor is underneath him. He never takes his helmet off. So in his particular case, in Boba Fett or Darth Vader or something like that, you would not have to go license the image and likeness rights for that particular actor because they're wearing a suit, you know, or they're made up or whatever. If I wanted to put Mark Hamill in my game um, as Luke Skywalker... Um, I would have to go to Mark Hamill and say, how much is this going to cost me to put you in the game? And like, how hard and how complicated and how much, right? And, and, and then generally, he also has approvals. So if I go make my Luke Skywalker character and I bring it, I then have to go back to Mark Hamill and say like, hey, do you like this? And if he doesn't, I got to keep changing it, keep changing it, keep changing it until he approves it. Then I got to go to the movie studio and say, okay, Mark says it's okay. Now is it approved with you guys? Okay, now it's approved there. You know, so on and so forth. And so so be aware that like those things can be really tricky sometimes. You know, A, it can be really expensive. Um, I think in a couple cases, um, so in a couple cases, I, I worked on a couple games where the, the image and likeness fee um, just to have the person in the game, just to show, you know, to have them in the game alone was in the neighborhood of about a million dollars. So it was not a, it was not cheap to put that person in the game. It was not, you know, it wasn't a trivial thing to put that person in the game. You know, and it was, you know, and especially when you're talking about a game that's maybe a $15 million game, right? So for me to, to spend a million dollars just to put, and this was not Mark Hamill, so I'm not, don't, you know, I'm not pointing at him. I just was using him as the Luke as the um, as an example. But you know, if I have to pay a million dollars for Luke, and then I got to pay a million dollars to Harrison Ford for Han Solo, and I got to pay a million dollars to you know Carrie Fisher for um, whatever. Like next thing you know, I just spent like five million, ten million dollars on a fifteen million dollar game. Like I can't do that. I can't afford it, right? And so that's you know that's something to be aware of. Besides the time delays. There's all the costs. You get into like music. Music's the same thing. Like, you know, just to go get a, a theme song. Now, stuff has changed now. I think I think more artists are kind of willing to work with you when you want a, a lead song or a title song or whatever. But I still remember like 20 years ago going to some big stars and talking to them about, you know, putting one of their songs. Because this, again, was like a movie. Oops. It looks like it might have froze here. Oh. Okay, it looks like we're back. Okay. So I saw that... Um, let's see here. All right, it looks like it's lagging a little bit here. Hopefully everybody can hear me. Oh. All right, it's... Lagging up... Hmm. All right. Well, sorry, everybody, if this is freaking out. It looks like it's having technical difficulties. Um, so I'm not sure if I should keep talking or, or not right now because it just... Weird. All right. Well... Looks like we're having some weird technical problems. I was warned we've been having some technical issues. Um, so I'm noticing that, that YouTube is lagging right now really badly. So I'm not sure what's causing that. Hmm. Are you guys still able to hear me okay? Okay. 
Or is the lag getting really bad and not um, 